Who do you trust? The reason I ask that question is uh, your ability to make decisions is in large part affected by the people you trust. I give you advice. Some of the biggest mistakes we've made come between, because we listen to people who gave us bad advice. Anybody identify with that? Could have been a salesman, could have been a friend, could have been your spouse. Said something, directed our influence, and um, big decisions were made that we regretted at times. It's interesting that uh, the one in whom you trust can influence you to chart the course of your life. And it can determine your eternal destiny. Whom do you trust? I bring that up because as we get to Proverbs chapter 3, we're going to see that we're told to trust in the Lord. And we're going to look at this because uh, there are 12 verses in Proverbs chapter 3. Every odd number verse in this little section tells what we are to do as we trust in God. And every even numbered verse gives a promise for what will happen to us if we do it God's way. So trusting in the Lord is so important. This, like chapter 1, we find the father writing and sharing his wisdom with his son. And uh, he's sharing the truth of God. We see that in verse 1. He says, my son, and again at the end in verse 11. And as we study this together, we're going to learn some amazing things that will help us make decisions. Do you have an important decision to make? Well, you came to church on the right day because trusting the Lord is key to making good decisions in life. So would you stand with me and let's read Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. You can use a Bible in the rack in front of you. It's on page 528. You can use your own Bible, iPad, iPhone, Android, or you can just read it on the screen. Proverbs chapter 3, let us hear the word of the Lord. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for the length of days and the years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father the son in whom he delights. This is the word of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, when I read that the first time, I thought, now wait a minute. This is telling me that if I just obey God, uh, live a life of love and, you know, fear him and run from evil and all that stuff, he's going to give me a long life. He's going to make me prosperous, I'm going to have money, I'm going to be popular, I'm going to have favor with God and man. That sounds to me like prosperity gospel. <laughs> so what do we hear from TV preachers? You just do your part and God will pour it out on you. And so I think, I think it's good for us to, at the beginning here to say these are promises, but they're general promises because we do live in a broken world. We live in a world influenced by sin. Someday, all of these promises will come true in completion. 
We've just studied Revelation, we know that. But for now, generally speaking, people who trust in the Lord and live according to His way do live longer lives. They do experience peace. There is a vitality that comes with trusting in the Lord. General truths that we can hold on to. Of course, they're not always true. We live in a broken world. There are fires. There are floods. There are sadnesses and trials in life. But generally speaking, as we live as God told us to live and trust in Him, we know that He will straight, straighten the path. That, that straight path is a, a metaphor for showing us the life of wisdom. So I wrote down what I think is the main idea of this passage. It's, if we trust the Lord without reservation, He will make our path straight. He'll show us the path of wisdom. And the aim of the passage, the purpose that I think the author has for us, is to learn to trust God in everything from the heart. Three times in this passage, verse 1, verse 3, and 5, the word heart comes. It's not talking about the beating heart. It's talking about the inner life of a believer. So let's look at it. I, I think it'd be good for us to start with verses 5 and 6. And the Bible says to trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make straight your paths. Do you notice here there are three things that we're to do and one thing that God does. Let's look at the three things we have to do. First of all, he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Who do you trust? If you trust someone, you believe and have confidence in them that they have your best interests at heart. You believe that they want the best for you. You know that they want to come alongside to support you. You have confidence in them. Do you have confidence in the Lord? See, when Pastor Robin started this series last week, he said, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Well, what is the fear of the Lord? Fearing the Lord means trusting the Lord, having confidence that He has our best interests at heart. Trust is so important to live a life of wisdom. I had a friend who was driving a truck and he noticed the oil light came on and he, had, he ignored it. And one day he was traveling down I-380 and this engine started to make a lot of noise and he pulled his truck off around Wilson Avenue and uh, not long later the uh, mechanic gave him the bad news. Your engine has blown up. Why? Because oil is necessary for an engine to run well. Trusting the Lord is the oil that makes life work. If you don't have trust in the Lord, you're not going to enjoy the life that He intended you to live. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. You say, but, but can I really trust God? Maybe you're going through a hard time right now, economically, or uh, you've got a ruined relationship that's disrupting your life. Uh, whatever it is, you're saying, but can I really trust the Lord? Well, and we're reminded over and over again that the God we trust loves us so much He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. Our God is love. His arm is not too short to save us. He will never leave us or forsake us. He works all things together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. And according to Romans 8, nothing separates us from God's love. And at this very moment, Jesus Christ is praying for you and for me. That's the kind of God we have. And so the writer of Proverbs says, trust in the Lord, trust in Him, and trust Him with all your heart. Trust Him with all your heart. The heart isn't the organ that pumps blood. The heart is speaking of all that is within us, our emotions, our intellect, 
our will, our discernment, our understanding, all that is within us is the heart of a human being. He says, trust in the Lord with your entire being. Trust Him without reservation. Trust in Him because He has your best interests in mind. Trust in the Lord. Do you trust the Lord? Can you say, I trust in Him with all my heart? And then he tells us something else. Do not lean on your own understanding. Oh, that is so countercultural. Every time we look, somebody's telling us, just go with your gut. That's a very dangerous thing to do. Oh, just follow your heart. Oh, boy. I want to tell you something. I don't trust my heart. Does that surprise you? You say, you're a pastor? I don't trust my heart. One day, my heart tells me, God can move mountains. The next day, my heart says, oh boy, this problem's too big. Do you think God can handle it? And the third day, Lord, do you even exist? That's what my heart says. He says, do not trust your own understanding. It becomes very dangerous. Instead, we're to trust Him and His wisdom rather than depend on our own finite mistaken, often mistaken, and tainted understanding. Well, I think a couple of illustrations will help. A few years ago, I had to use one of these gadgets, a very complicated instrument that people use after surgery on their hips. I had one hip surgery and then a second hip surgery, and I was glad I didn't have three hips. First of all, I started out with a walker. That was quite a challenge. And then I graduated. The doctor said, you can graduate to a cane. I thought, whoopee, how, hallelujah, I get a cane. And so I we bought this cane. It wasn't very expensive. And, and I, I just took off around the neighborhood and uh, realized about 10 steps in that I must be using the wrong hand because it wasn't working. So I tried the other side, and that worked a little better. But uh, I learned something. You know, recovering from surgery, you need to rely on something. But this thing on which I relied would sometimes get caused me to stumble because it would get in the way of my feet. And inevitably, I'd be sitting there eating somewhere, and it would fall on the floor, and then I couldn't get down to the floor to get it. And so I I think that in many ways, that verse, don't rely on your own understanding, uh, is applicable here. Just as a cane can trip us up, our understanding can trip us up. When we depend on our own intellect and our own opinions and what we think is best, rather than God's, we can be tripped up. Let, let me say it a different way. Let's, let's say that I'm resting on this table. Uh, did you check your chair before you sat down on it? You trusted the chair when you sat down, didn't you? Well, I'm going to trust this table, and I'm going to lean on it. And I'm going to lean on it. And see, I'm, I'm going to try not to get tripped up by the cane while I lean on the table. Now, Let's say that this is representing my trust in the Lord. I'm I'm trusting the Lord. But now what happens? Problems come, and I start to worry, and then it seems as if God isn't even there to help me, and He's gone. Do I fall as I'm leaning on the Lord? If this represents my leaning on the Lord, what I do is jump back. Oh, I'm still standing. Why? Well, because my legs are my safety net. That's the way we trust, isn't it? Oh, I'm trusting the Lord. I'm trusting the Lord. I'm trusting the Lord. But then the hardships come. Oh, I'm still standing. I'm going to go to Google. I'm going to Google my problem. I'm going to, maybe YouTube has a solution. I'm going to ask a friend. See, so often, trusting the Lord becomes our last option rather than our first resort. So he tells us in, in a loving manner, don't trust in your own understanding. We have an infinite God of amazing intellect who is out for our well-being. Trust in the Lord. Are you trusting Him? Or are you trusting yourself? Third, he says, in all your ways, acknowledge Him. I uh, was out in the lobby noticing you as people came in through the door. and When you saw someone you knew, you acknowledged them. Hi! 
hi, you said. You sometimes give them a hug, handshake. Hello. To acknowledge means to recognize, to, to value, to see someone that you know, to acknowledge their presence with you. And what this means in acknowledging him is that in every area of life, he wants us to trust him and acknowledge that we know him and depend on him. Depend on him fully in every area of life. Now, now we understand this. When the boss speaks, we acknowledge our boss, don't we? We listen to our boss. By the way, if you're not doing that, just word of advice, <laughs> if you want to keep your job, you listen when the boss speaks. I've noticed that soldiers, when they see their commanding officer, acknowledge with a salute. We know what this means. What this is telling us is that in every situation, in every situation, we acknowledge Jesus Christ. Now, now, let me give you a couple examples of how this works. Let's say that you're working away in your job and your employer comes in and she says, I want you to do this or that. And as you're working, you're thinking, I don't feel comfortable with what she's asked me to do. It seems dishonest. And so now you're caught in a dilemma. You feel the panic welling up. What am I going to do now? They've asked me to do something dishonest. If I speak up, I may lose my job. What do I do? And then you remember Proverbs chapter 3, 5, and 6. In all your ways, acknowledge him. You say, oh, Lord, okay, I'm going to acknowledge you. You're here with me. And so I'm going to have the courage. I'm going to say to my boss, you know, thank you for what you've asked me to do, but I feel like it's dishonest. I just can't do it. I'm uncomfortable with it. Now you risk losing your job, but at least you know what to do. You have your decision made for you when you know that Christ is with you. You've acknowledged him. Let me say it another way. Let's say you're in a family discussion, and you know what you want, and you've explained it, and you're getting pushback. And then what happens? You, you kind of go from wanting something to now demanding it. And you find yourself getting angry. And, you, and you're just about ready to lash out. When you remember Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Oh, and just before you cross the line and unleash your anger. The Bible says be angry, but don't sin. Just before you sin in your anger, you pause. You say, oh, Lord, I'm acknowledging you. You're here with me. Put a guard on my lips. Help me to calm down. Help me to work through this with my family in a calm way. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't rely on your own understanding. In all your ways, Acknowledge Him. And what's He going to do then? Well, He will make your path straight. That means it's a highway project for God. When we trust in Him, He goes before us as we make these tough decisions in life, and He removes the boulders, He takes the trees out, He patches up the potholes so that we can continue on the path of life. Now you say, whoa, whoa, whoa. I've been trusting the Lord, and there's a lot of obstacles in front of me. It doesn't mean that he's going to remove the all obstacles from life, but God will walk with us on this path of wisdom, and even as we confront the problems and trials of the day, we're learning to trust him. We're learning to grow in our faith. We're learning to be more like Jesus. We're being honed into his image. He is working in us powerfully as we follow him. That's what it means. He makes our paths straight. He gives us wisdom that we would not have had had we not had to face the question or decision that was before us. Isn't it amazing that we have such a wonderful God? He tells us to trust in Him. I just love the book of Genesis. I've been studying uh, Jacob, a man named Jacob back in Genesis. And uh, he has 12 sons. And one of his sons named Joseph uh, had all these dreams and his brothers got mad at him and sold him into slavery. And uh, the dad was very sad about this. 
As the years went by, uh, he had a younger son named Benjamin that was the delight of his eyes. Jacob just loved Benjamin. Uh, Benjamin was the son of, of his wife who passed away, and he just loved J Benjamin. And he was so sad because of losing Joseph. But the food ran out. There was a famine in the land. And so he, one of his sons says, well, I hear there's, there's food in Egypt. And so he, he sends his ten sons. Joseph is gone. Benjamin, he's not going to let go. <laughs> so his ten sons go to Egypt. And when they get to Egypt, they meet this really mean man. He's an Egyptian, and he, he says, you're spies. Well, they don't know that it's Joseph. They haven't seen Joseph for 20 years, but Joseph, whole story of Joseph, he, he's now the second in command in Egypt responsible for famine relief. And uh, Joseph says, y you know, I think you're spies, and, and I tell you what, I I'll give you grain this time, but I'm going to send you home with that grain, and I'm going to keep one of you here in prison. Happened to be a brother named Simeon. Simeon's going to stay in prison. You take that food home, but don't come back and ask me for more food unless you bring that youngest brother, Benjamin, with you. Oh, boy. They were so uptight. And they left. They went home to their dad. They said, Dad, Simeon's in prison, and, and here's the food, but we can't get any more unless we take Benjamin back with us. And, and his, at their father, Jacob, says, You knuckleheads! Now, that's the Shile translation of the Hebrew language there. He says, no way am I going to let go of my son Benjamin. Benjamin's too important to me. Well, that becomes a very important decision as the food is running out and you're about ready to starve to death. His sons kept coming back, Dad, we've got to go back to Egypt to get more food. No, you're not taking my son Benjamin. No. And finally, they're all about to starve to death. And Judah comes forward. He says, Dad, 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 we got to do it. And something changed for Jacob. As much as he held on to that boy, Benjamin, and how excruciating that decision must have been, he finally released Benjamin to go with his brothers to Egypt. Why did he let him go? We find in Genesis 43, verse 14, how it was that Jacob let him go. Jacob says to his sons, May God Almighty grant you mercy before this man. Nobody knew it was Joseph. And may he send back your other brother and Benjamin. And as for me, I am bereaved of my children. I am bereaved. So do you see what's going on here? He's saying, I'm giving you up to God Almighty. You know what the word God Almighty is? God El Shaddai. God the all-powerful one. He finally was able to come to that point where he said, trust in the Lord with all your heart and even give up his son Benjamin, grieving as if he'd never see him again because he believed that God is Almighty. That's what you and I are called to do. It's so hard for us to make a decision on something we love more than God. And he comes to us in mercy. I like how Jesus said it. He said, you worry so much, Matthew chapter 6. You worry about food, you worry about clothes, you worry about... And when you worry, you're just like people who don't even believe in God. But he said it in a loving way. And he says, there's no need to worry. Matthew 6, but seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. And all these things you worry about will be added to you. God will take care of your needs. So my question for you this morning is, have you really yielded control? Do you trust in God? Do you have confidence that He is both powerful and good? and has your best interests at heart? Or are you depending on your own understanding? Are you able to bring every situation into acknowledging Him and know that He will make your path straight? Are you really doing it? You say, well, how would I know if I'm really trusting the Lord? Well, that's where the rest of Proverbs 3 comes in. 
Very quickly, let me show you five ways you'll know you are trusting God. And by the way, there's some blanks to fill in in your program. I do that because we have children with us through the summer, and it gives them a way to fill in the blanks and kind of keep track of where we're going. So if you're five years old or 50 years old or 85 years old, you can fill it in, and this will be a way to remember where we're going. Five ways to know if you really trust in the Lord. Let's look at them. The first one is, I am trusting the Lord if I obey the Lord's commands. Verses 1 and 2. Look at it. My son, don't forget my teaching. We have a tendency to do that. But let your heart, there it is again, keep my commandments for the length of days and the years of life and the peace they will add to you. So in other words, don't forget God's commands, but let your heart obey without reservation. Act on what you believe. And the benefit is that those who obey God generally live longer, healthier lives without negative uh, effects. I mean, there's a, there's a definite physical, emotional, spiritual benefit to doing things God's way. One of the guys in my Tuesday morning study says, you know, when we get angry and then sin in our anger, you know, we're not doing what God told us to do. We're not obeying His command. And so we get all tight. He says, then they take our blood pressure and we're right, ready to have a coronary. See, when we don't do things God's way, we put our physical health at risk. We, we hinder our emotional health. We live with regret and sorrow and pain. And, and so much of that could be relieved if we just do what God tells us to do. That's what His Word says. And by the way, they, we have these baptisms. One of the first steps of obedience is to be baptized. The Bible says, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them. Je Jesus said, when you come to know Christ and your heart has been washed clean, the first thing you should do is sign up to be baptized. Because what, when you go under the water, it signifies you're identifying with Jesus in his death, your death to the old life. When you come up out of that water, you're signifying your union with Christ in resurrection, his resurrection power living in you. It's the first step in a life of obedience. Have you taken that first step? You say, well, it's too late to do that today. Yeah, but the next time we're going to do baptisms is at family camp, the end of July. We're going over to Hidden Acres. And we're not going to have, be, have you be baptized in a tub. We're going to be baptized in a lake. How about that? The Letchler Lake. It may be a little green, but green won't hurt you. It's a wonderful thing to, to witness a baptism. We'd love to have you come along. You get to know people. You learn who, they, who we are as a family. And it's so much easier to obey God's commands when you're walking with others. Christianity is not an isolation sport. It, it's a walk with your family. Obey God's commands. If you trust in the Lord, you obey Him. You say, well... I'd be humiliated. I'd come up here and be all wet. I have to share my story. Yeah, that, that's the point. We're dying to ourselves and living for Christ. We're telling our family we want to live for Christ. Doesn't mean we're going to be perfect and do everything right, but it's a first step to walking with the Lord. What's the second step? Well, he tells us in the next two verses, three and four, live a life of love. He says, let not steadfast love and first faithfulness forsake you. Steadfast love and faithfulness is a key term. It's one word in the Hebrew language, chesed. H-E-S-E-D. Chesed. And the Hebrews put a C-H in front of H to make it sound like chesed. So turn to the person on your right and life, left and say, chesed. Some of you are going, oh, I don't trust you, Randy. I'm not going to do that. Others of you are doing it, and now you need Kleenex to wipe your faces because it's kind of mess. But that word means loving kindness, faithfulness. And what he's saying is, let the, the covenant love that God has for us that we don't deserve, the love shown to us in the Lord Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection, let the love of God be like jewelry around your neck. That is, live out that life of love. And he says, write it on the tablet of your heart. 
so that when people see you, they say, that person is wise because they're somehow connected to God. Jesus has changed them. That's what he's saying. If you trust in the Lord, people will notice. And he even says here, so you will find favor and success in the sight of God and man. That's the blessing. That's the blessing that comes. People will see it. You know, generally speaking, employers like Christian employees. Why is that? Generally speaking, it's because they tend to be hardworking. They tend to be hardworking because they're much more concerned about pleasing God than they even are their boss. They treat people well. They're fair. They're kind. They're ethical in their behavior. Most employers like Christians. Most neighbors like Christians because they tend to keep the grass cut. They tend to bring cookies and share things. Generally, it's true that when you let the love of God flow through you to others, you'll experience some degree of favor. Favor with God and man. Doesn't mean that sometimes people may turn sideways because you're a Christian, mock you, scorn you. Uh, it doesn't mean you may not get fired from a job because you're ethical. It doesn't mean that uh, you might not be persecuted or even martyred for your faith. But the Bible says this in Proverbs 16, verse 7, When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. One of the things that's said about the Lord Jesus is that he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. One author said it this way, a loyal person acts responsibly. A kind person works for justice for others. Thoughts and words are not enough. Do your actions measure up to your attitudes? See, are you wearing the love of God? Or would people say you're a kind of a cantankerous person? If you're trusting in the Lord, the love and kindness of God should be flowing through you to others in increasing measure. We're not perfect. We've got a ways to go, but increasingly, the love of God is shown through us. See, if we trust the Lord, we'll obey His commands, we'll live a life of love. And third, if we really, really trust in the Lord, we will fear the Lord and uh, run from evil. Fear the Lord. He says, do not be wise in your own eyes, verse 7. That's always the temptation to think we know more than everybody else. Instead, fear the Lord. That's a, that's a statement of humility. I humble myself before the Lord, and I turn away from evil. What happens then? It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Healing and refreshment are enjoying physical vitality and spiritual renewal with God. It's His reward for running from evil. So it'd be like this. You know, you're sitting in your room all alone. Men have more difficulty with this than women, but women also. And you're sitting all alone with your computer, no one else in the room, and you're clicking away, and just by the search engine you use and the way your fingers type in words, you can soon go to the most tempting spots, sensuous stuff. You can come to the worst pornography imaginable. And so even as you're going there, suddenly the Spirit of God brings Proverbs 3 to mind. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Run from evil. And you stop. And James 4, 7 comes crashing into your mind. Submit to to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You say, oh God, I'm acknowledging you. I need your help. I am about to do what I shouldn't do. And the thought of Jesus writhing on that cross, even because of our sensuousness, causes you to close the lid of that computer and walk into a place where you're with others. 
See, that's only what the Holy Spirit of God can do. We are so vulnerable to temptations. We all struggle with besetting sins. They start out with just a little piece of our life. Oh, I'm so attracted to this little thing. And then it grows. And we're thinking about it two or three times a day. And then it grows larger. And it becomes kind of a primary thought. And pretty soon it overtakes our life. It's what we live for. We get up thinking about it. We go to bed thinking about it. We wake up in the middle of the night thinking about it. It's an addiction. It's a besetting sin. And Jesus said, I came to set the captives free. Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection comes against all counterfeit gods, all loves, our pride. And he says, I can set you free. And you see what that does. People who've struggled for years with psychosomatic illnesses find themselves becoming healthier physically. God helps them with what they read, the kind of people they spend time with. Their life begins to improve. And it happens because we've learned to trust in the Lord. You see how that works? Are you trusting the Lord? My prayer is that throughout the course of this study of Proverbs, people will be set free. Set free from lust. Set free from anger. Set free from cynicism set free from pride so that we can be open to the glorious life that Jesus planned for us. I'm surprised there's no amens to that, but I'll say amen. Thank you. One, one person agreed. Fourth, if you say you trust God, are you honoring God's provision? Oh boy, here we go. Honor the Lord with your wealth. That's right. If we really trust the Lord, even our pocketbook comes under his care. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. So the first thing we do is give to the Lord out of gratitude. We say he owns it all, and so we're just giving back a portion in gratitude. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of your produce. And then he says, if we do that, our barns will be filled with plenty and our vats will be bursting with wine. This made a lot of sense in an agricultural community. So you pick the grapes, you throw them in a drum, and, and you start to squish them with your feet. I would love to live during Bible time. I hope they have one of these in heaven. I'm going to squish the grapes. And as you're squishing the grapes, they keep squishing so much they overflow the vat. Now what's he saying? Is that prosperity gospel? What he's saying is that as we honor the Lord and, and take our hands off our money and honor him with it in first place, he provides what we need so that we can keep on giving. Jesus said it this way in Luke 6:38: Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, poured into your lap. They will pour out to you as you've poured out to others. People who are generous, generous with God and generous with others, find that generosity returning to them. God provides what we need. So what does that mean? I'll tell you what it means for my wife and I. We get the paycheck. And we have to sit down and write the first check. Do we say, oh, well, I'm going to pay all my bills, and then if I have anything left, I'll see if I can give something to God. Well... Or, no, I need to save because you never know what might happen. Great Britain is now out of the European Union and a hoarding. Or do we say, ah, amazing, God has given us from his bounty again. And so let's make the first check a check for investing in his kingdom. Whether it's Stonebridge or mission. We especially love giving, not only to Stonebridge, but to missionaries. You get these young kids, they want to go on short-term mission trips. We love that. And so we write the first check to honor the Lord. And the Bible tells us that as we do that, God provides what we need, not so we can get rich, but so we can give more. That's the way 
God is a generous God. And His children, as they trust in Him, even with money, find He is increasingly generous. <laughs> oh, man. So do you really trust the Lord? Are you obeying His commands? Are you living a life of love? Are you running from evil? Have you learned to let go of your billfold and trust in Him with the first fruits? Number five is the most difficult. If you trust in the Lord, you will accept God's discipline. This is not a very easy thing to talk about because it involves suffering. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. It's so easy to despise the Lord's discipline and to grow weary really fast. When we go through hardship, we lose a child, we get fired from a job, our kids won't talk to us, our parents aren't living up to an example that we hope they would. It's so difficult. We get frustrated and we begin to think, God, can I trust you? And we're really good in our culture at describing the causes of suffering. It's genetic. It's biological. It's a chemical imbalance. It's a relational difficulty. It's a hard-nosed parent. It's that person at work. We, cause, we have all kinds of causes. But what we don't get in our culture is the purposes of suffering. And that's what he deals with in verse 12. He says, the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father and a son in whom he delights. In our very suffering, we learn things that cause our hearts to expand in faith, that show us that we can keep going, no matter how difficult it is, by help of the Spirit of God. We learn to be the people God designed us to be in the midst of suffering. And behind all suffering, even though we may not know all the purposes, we have a loving God who's guiding us through it. I remember talking to a woman who said that when she is a teenager, she would stay out all night and she'd come in in the morning and her mother wouldn't say anything to her. She just kind of looked down at her Bible. And she said she started to resent her parents because she said, I wonder if they really love me. They're not saying anything. I'm out all night. And she looked at her friends, and some of her friends had very strict parents who had strict curfews. She saw kids that she hung around with whose parents seemed to have their goal in life to make their kids' lives so miserable, thinking about all the time how they could keep them from doing things. And she came to this conclusion. The parents who were strict with their kids loved their kids. And that's exactly what we learn about God. Those whom the Lord loves, He disciplines. In Hebrews, that quotes this chapter and says, if you're not being disciplined, you're an illegitimate children, child. The very fact that you're a child of God means we will experience suffering. He is infinite in knowledge, we're not. But through that suffering, we experience the love of God. Can you trust Him for that? Say, oh, I can trust Him with my pocketbook, but not my suffering. Well, then for you, can you learn to trust Him even in your suffering? I'm going to dismiss uh, Jace. I don't know where you are, Jace. Where are you? Oh, Jace, can you raise your hand? Okay. All right. It's time for you to approach the tub. And as he does... Let's conclude in this way. There is one person who did everything Proverbs said to do and ended up losing his life for it. It says in Luke 2.52 that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. That's a direct quote from Proverbs 3. He did everything that God told him to do 
but he experienced the most horrid suffering. How can that be? The Bible says Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered. That is, Jesus, as a human being, was innocent, but he wasn't perfectly complete until he was matured through suffering. And the Bible says that Jesus alone, who is the only one who could live up to this, we can't, willingly submitted himself to the Father's will, hung on a Roman cross, and died bearing the weight of our sins and failures on his shoulders. And Hebrews 12 puts it this way. We have a great crowd of witnesses surrounding us. And though he suffered on the cross, he considered the joy set before him. Enduring the cross, despising the shame. And now he sits down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus is the only one who could live up to Proverbs 3. And he fulfilled it completely. And when we trust in him, he will help us to trust in him with all our heart and not lean on our own insight, but in all our ways acknowledge him, and he will make our path straight. Hallelujah. Father, thank you so much. We're feeble disciples. We need your help. We can't do it without you. Some of us have a lot of repenting to do. Forgive us. We rely on ourselves. We rely on our own in intellect. We rely on our own self. Forgive us, Lord. May we learn to trust in you, the joy of forgiveness and trust. Be with Jace as he's baptized this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And God is love. Let's give him a hand and say, Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you that we can trust in you. You have our best interests at heart. You are powerful and you are good. So trust in the Lord with all your heart. <laughs> Don't rely on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. As you're leaving today, would you reach out to someone you don't know? Introduce yourself. Make a new friend. Be the family of Jesus. And if you're new to our church, we'd love it if you'd go out and take a right and join us at the Starting Point Cafe. Love to have you be a part of it. Thank you for coming. May the Lord bless you.